On this episode of Around Texas, we hear from members of the Texas A&M Task Force One who responded to the 9-11 terrorist attacks 20 years ago and how it still affects them today. Also, we see how a new generation of Texas A&M students pay tribute to Aggies who 20 years ago honored 9-11 responders by wearing red, white, and blue to a football game at Kyle Field. Everything is bigger in Texas. The Texas A&M University system is no exception. Bigger plans, bigger ideas. We strive to make a bigger difference across the Lone Star State and around the world. 11 universities, eight state agencies, one mission, working every day to build a brighter tomorrow. Meet the people striving to make a Texas-sized difference every day across the A&M system. Welcome to Around Texas with Chancellor John Sharp. In 2001, first responders from Texas Task Force One, now named Texas A&M Task Force One, flew on military transports to Manhattan to be part of the historic response following the attacks on the World Trade Center. Now, 20 years later, we take a look back at that day. One of the guys that I worked with called me, and I was still laying in bed, and uh, he said, turn on the TV. And I said, all right, what channel? He said, it doesn't matter, just turn on the TV. I saw it was one of the World Trade Centers. It was a few minutes later that I saw the, the second plane hit, and I told him, I said, hey man, I, I don't think I'm coming to work today. I, I think we're gonna be heading to New York. I was an assistant chief for fire operations for Santa Fe County Fire and I got a page. Um, that page was, we need you to come into the warehouse, we're getting ready to go out the door. And it was uh, very sobering, very worrying, worrying for the, the safety of, of the people on the task force and wondering if I'd make it back if I went. I guess the, the toughest part for me was knowing that some incredible human beings had, had died. These were, these were some of the finest of both NYPD and Fire Department New York, as well as civilians who, you know, were some of the cream of the crop in the business industry in this country and, and the people that took care of that building. And um, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, um, that has a huge effect on us. <laughs> I don't like to talk about it too much. I mean, I, I really don't. Um, and, and it's not not because I uh, am so emotional that I can't, and it's not because I don't want to remember, because I do. Uh, it's like yesterday to me. I mean, we're talking 20 years. It's not 20 years to me, it was yesterday. It's very vivid. Uh, but the deepest emotion I have is the one that uh, we were prepared and we were there and we could help. The USAR uh, organizations across the United States were from earthquakes and, and building collapse that was caused by natural uh, disasters. Dr. Bennett started Texas A&M Task Force One because of what he saw at the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City. The evolution of uh, Texas Task Force One uh, really began as a state team, a team for the state of Texas. Uh, so I started working with our rescue people here at the training program and we reached out across the state to top rescue experts and brought these firefighters uh, together. And we put together a search and rescue team based on federal guidelines of what are the uh, positions, responsibility, and training necessary. And our first major federal deployment, uh, unfortunately, but our first one was to the World Trade Center. They passed out 
our federal uniforms for the first time. We'd had the state gray BDUs. Well, these were, were blue BDUs. And I never will forget this because they, they passed those out and to a man and woman in that room, you couldn't hear a word. Everybody was, was just staring at the American flag, every single person in that room. It was probably one of the most powerful things I remember. It was so visually overwhelming. It was huge, it was just massive. The destruction level, massive. Um, the, there was still active fire uh, down in the bowels of those buildings. And it really resonated to me that, that if I tried to look at this as this massive scene, that's overwhelming. But if you take it into smaller pieces and realize that you have small achievable bits to do, then it makes it something that you can actually accomplish. I don't think when we joined this team and started back in 97, we ever thought anything like 9-11, whether it be the Pentagon or the World Trade Center was in the realm of possibilities. Even though we planned for events like that, we didn't plan for the cause, we planned for the outcome. And so, you know, as, as a young firefighter, I wanted to be wherever the action was. If there was a fire on the other side of town, I wanted to do anything I could to get to the other side of town so that I could fight fire. That was my job. That's what I wanted to do. And I think the draw to this task force being part of Texas A&M University was the fact that we were gonna get the best training on the planet. We were gonna get the best equipment and the latest break-in equipment on the planet because of the engineering extension capabilities that we have to learn and develop new technologies. And we were gonna be taken care of when we went. And I think those were the three most important things to us. There's 20 members that are still on Texas A&M Task Force One that were, that were at the World Trade Center. Some of them were probably third or fourth year firefighters at their department. Almost every single one of those is a senior leader on our team right now. They bring that expertise, they bring that passion, they bring that drive. They, they bring the fact that they're striving to do a better job on every single uh, incident that they go out on, and that's infectious. We learned that it worked. Everything worked. The, the high angle skills of cutting the metal worked. Working with the torches, moving things out, hand signals back and forth with crane operators so they knew what we wanted and what they needed to do. To work as a team, to fit into other people's teams, it worked. When you're part of a team that has high standards, everybody on that team knows that there's high standards and that basically brings the standard of the team um, along with, with those leaders. So we came back with the confidence that we knew what to do. Obviously we came back with anguish and hurt and all those emotions, but as a team, we were a team and we knew we were a team. We, we, had, we had moved to a new level. I have a, a favorite thing that I listen for when people introduce themselves uh, during kind of uh, question and answer sessions with, with the members of, of Texas A&M Task Force One, because inevitably somebody will say, hi, my name's so-and-so, and I've been with the team since inception. Oh. That's a long time to be doing what we do. And they're all really proud of being able to do that. This is a 9-11 remembrance segment uh, Jeff Saunders was a member of the New Mexico Task Force on 9-11. Uh, he was deployed to the Pentagon. And Jeff, welcome. And when did you become the director of Task Force One uh, here at, in Texas at A&M? It's been 17 years, 2004. I was uh, not looking for a job. I was uh, assistant fire chief, thought I had a 
I thought I had it made on the position I was in. And uh, one of the people from Texas A&M Task Force One said they were looking for a program manager. I told my boss, the fire chief, I said, I'm gonna apply for what I think is my career job, my perfect job, the one that I've always wanted in my life. Luckily, I got the job in 2004. Great. How do you think 9-11 uh, uh, changed Task Force One, or, or did it change Task Force One? It absolutely changed Task Force One. Uh, the members that went uh, were lucky enough to work with uh, the, their counterparts from the other states, to work with uh, New York Task Force One made up of uh, NYPD and, and FDNY. Um, those lifetime uh, relationships have really helped us take what we know um, for structural collapse and and how to respond uh, to that next level. Well, tell me how Texas A&M Task Force One deals with, with FEMA. Uh, sometimes, I'm sure, as you know, it's a complicated process, but just in a nutshell, uh, tell us when FEMA deploys you, what, what authority they have over y'all. We are one of 28 teams, and when there's something that happens outside of the state of Texas, there's the first three teams that go are the three closest. But if it's a big enough incident, say the Surfside incident, the, the, the collapse of the, the towers in Surfside, they took many teams from around the country. So they would call us and ask us to deploy whatever resource they wanted. I assume 9-11 is still on the minds of the folks in the task force, particularly those who, who dealt in that, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. There's 20 members that have been uh, on the task force since inception, and those 20 members were at the World Trade Center as well. They're senior leadership now for Texas A&M Task Force One, and all of those lessons learned are shared with all of the new members every time we get a new one coming on the team. You know, a lot of people, when they see someone rescued in the hurricane or they see uh, someone working a fire, whether it's here or California uh, or any kind of emergency that the governor declares, it's always Texas A&M Task Force One that, that is, the, is the driver of, of, of all of that. How would you rate, you've seen task forces, you've seen them in New Mexico, you've seen them all over the country, maybe all over the world. How would you rate Texas A&M Task Force One uh, in, the, in the country? We are right up there at the top of the top. And I think we take pride in being able to do what we do. We take pride in being able to respond at a moment's notice. We, I, have, I have my own saying, we do the most good for the most people in the least amount of time. And routinely, every time the team goes out, that's what they do. They've completed every mission that's ever been asked for them, and, and, and that puts us right up there at, at the best. I agree. And Texas A&M Task Force One is the epitome of the core value of selfless service and what, what Aggies are about and what, what the Texas A&M system is about. So, Jeff, thank you for what you do, and we'll be right back. In the days following the 9-11 tragedy, Texas A&M students organized a grassroots effort to show support for first responders by wearing red, white, and blue to a football game at Kyle Field. 20 years later, Texas A&M honored that legacy by standing for America once again. September 11, 2001 was a day that we'll never forget and trying to wrestle with all those emotions as a 20-year-old was, was tough. You know, it was, it was really a surreal moment. A lot of people were emotional. We were wondering what could a bunch of poor college kids in Texas do to help. News had started traveling about what was going on and, and it was very quiet and, and kind of uncharacteristic of, of campus. As the day of September 11th went on, people probably transitioned at their own pace of, okay, I've, I've started the process, what happened, now what can I do? 
we just quickly set out and said, let's see if we can make something out of this. This is what we want to do. This is our idea. Let's see if we can uh, have everyone wear red, white, and blue shirts throughout the stadium. I don't even know exactly what caused it to happen. We knew that the next game was in about 10 days. So if we wanted to do something, we needed to do it quickly. Good to have you along today, the Aggies at Oklahoma State. It is red, white, and blue day today at Kyle Field. A student uh, project that has just turned out beautifully. The setting here today is just unbelievable. It really makes you proud to be an American, to be quite honest with you. And all I can say is God bless America and each and every person that's gathered here today. You know, I think a and is the only type of place that could really pull this off. We had no idea that this is something that we'd still be talking about or see images of uh, decades later. I mean, everywhere you went, you heard people talking about the red, white, and blue out and the work that those students were doing. And I think it's typical of, of uh, the type of students that we have at Texas A&M. And I, they, I mean, they just went way beyond what you would expect. You know, I, I think the first thing we realized we had to do was was get some kind of official blessing from A&M to, to try to do this, right? We immediately kind of formed a plan of um, splitting up and going to talk to various leaders um, across the university. And it was met initially with uh, some lukewarm acceptance, uh, just because you had five students who were not affiliated with any one organization, trying to change uh, a game day procedure in 10 days to drastically change the stadium from maroon to red, white, and blue. And so we got approval from people to move forward and try to go with the idea. And that's when we went to Ken, I believe it was on Friday. So we had five students, uh, Texas A&M students, come into my office and talk to me about uh, the potential of doing red, white, and blue shirts for the stadium. And when I, when I first heard their request, you know, I thought it was just for the student side. Uh, but they told me, no, we want a red, white, and blue the whole stadium. We walked in with an idea and, em you know, empty pockets. We didn't have any way of, of financing this. We hadn't really thought about that. We just had an idea. And the Aggie family, we were happy to, to, to at least listen. Uh, so I took a pause. I said, let me think about it. And we, the next day I called them. I said, we're in for 5,000 shirts. And I thought, really honestly, I thought, okay, that was, that was the end of that. There's not a whole lot I remember vividly because it was just a blur. It was a massive whirlwind. The sale of shirts happened really, really quickly. 5,000, the next day it was 10,000 shirts they needed, then 20,000 shirts, and it was just a snowball after that. The momentum for those kids was outrageous. So that's when we really put out the call all over the state and, and even surrounding states to find red, white, and blue shirts. Uh, because Texas had basically run out of them, we'd used them all. Game day, I got to campus about 6 a.m. There were already lines of people to buy shirts, both current students, former students who had driven into town, members of the Bryan College Station community. It was just hundreds of people already in line. And we were unloading t-shirts off of, off of trucks, uh, just hot off the press from being printed that night. And we were selling them out of the back of trucks for, for $5 a t-shirt. Three hours before game time, you begin to see all of those red and white, uh, red, white, and blue shirts walking around. I can't, I can't remember ever seeing a maroon shirt that day, which is unusual at a football game at Texas A&M that you don't have a maroon shirt on. We were flooded with those shirts, and you realized then that that was going to be something when we went into the stadium, that this had really been a success. We, in 10 days, were able to achieve something um, that no one could have ever probably forecasted, um, and, and obviously is something that um, everyone is still very proud of. But it took a lot of coordination, it took a lot of volunteers, it took a lot of desire from the Aggie family, kind of in unison, to chip in to help, and this was kind of our outlet uh, to do that. Shortly after the event, a group of former students paid for the five of us and several other Aggies to travel to New York to present uh, checks to both the Firefighters Association and the Police Officers Association of New York for the proceeds that were raised during Red, White, and Blue Out as part of their benevolent funds. 
donating that to them and seeing the genuine appreciation um, for the effort that we had done. I think when we showed them the picture, they were even more amazed by that than the, the money that we donated. And it wasn't just the five of us, it was thousands of volunteers. You know, it really was an entire community coming together and, and doing something good. Today, Americans stand united. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's common every single year on the anniversary of 9-11 for this photo, for this event to be talked about and shared. Um, it's always been a really defining and proud moment for the 12th man, and I think that it's something that 20 years later we get to look at and say, you know, not much has changed in terms of the spirit and intentionality behind it. Although we may never fully be able to recreate the momentum, the energy that was experienced 10 days after 9-11, back in, in 2001 when the original Red, White & Blue game was held, I think that this effort is going to be a visual representation of just how much we appreciate our first responders who serve the Aggie community and every community outside of um, Aggieland as well. The unique thing about the red, white, and blue game this time around is our main focus is donating money. So the donations are gonna be going to Texas A&M Task Force One and Points of Light. And so I think that adds to the magic of it. Recreating this game came from a place of wanting to show the world that that same spirit that lived 20 years ago in that game is still present today. Good evening, football fans, and welcome to Kyle Field, the largest football venue in the great state of Texas. This is the home of the 12th man and your fighting Texas Aggie. Most of the students here were either not even born or were, you know, one or two years old at the time. And to see them want to recreate something that happened 20 years ago is, is really pretty, pretty amazing. The 20th year anniversary of the original Red, White and Blue game is going to be a moment to remember. And I think overall it's very inspiring to, to see everything come full circle. I'm here with Texas A&M University Athletic Director Ross Bjork. Uh, we're going to be talking about the red, white, and blue game. Uh, Ross, why was it important uh, for athletics to play a role in remembering uh, that side of 9-11 of, uh, yeah, with the red, well, white, and blue game? Well, thanks for having me on today, Chancellor Sharp. And as you know, 20 years ago, this was a student-led effort where Texas A&M gathered the community after the tragic events of 9-11 and, and really showcased, I think, what it means to be an Aggie, patriotism, and really coming together in a sign of unity. And so last fall, as the football season was winding down, I got an email from Eric Mendoza, the, the former student body president here at Texas A&M, and he said that the students would like to recreate a 20th commemoration of uh, September 11th uh, from 2001. And I said, we're all in. How do we get involved? What do we need to do? So the fact that it's student led, I think just shows another great example of what it means uh, to be a student here at Texas A&M and, and show the leadership that they uh, possess. And talk a little bit, Ross, about how student involvement at A&M is is different and special uh, to the game day experience in football and other sports. Absolutely. Well, the, the 12th man, there's nothing else like it. It's, it's really unrivaled, I think, in, in higher education and college athletics. To, to have 35,000 students come to your football games and have them stand the entire game and they never leave, that just signifies the, the passion and energy. So to, to bottle that around a, a game like this where we're going to recreate something that happened 20 years ago in the red, white, and blue, and the stadium's gonna be packed. Again, it just goes to the core values, it goes to that leadership and that selfless service that our, I think our students embody. And we've always been known for a bit of patriotism at Texas A&M as well. Right. How, how does events like this help attract coaches uh, and, and talent and students and, and uh, athletes? Absolutely, well, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. When I was called about Texas A&M, to come here, you always want to go to a place where they care, where they care about education, they care about athletics, they care about spirit and tradition. 
And to me, there's no better place than Texas A&M. So when other people see this example, whether we're attracting a coach or a staff member or a student athlete, they care at Texas A&M. I want to be part of that atmosphere. So it, I think it drives everything that we do in recruiting. And this is just another great example. Well, Ross, what should Aggies look forward to in Kyle Field in 2021? Chancellor Sharp, it's really a full experience. Getting back to what was normal before COVID, 102,733 people yelling for the Aggies, having the band back in, in Kyle Field, having them be on the field for halftime and, and pregame performances, all the things that we're used to around Aggie football, tailgating before the game, all those experiences are back. We got a few tweaks. We have uh, cashless concessions and we have digital ticketing now, but everything is geared around what it means to be an Aggie and all those traditions that we're used to. So really back to normal is the simple answer. Well, thank you, Ross. And thank you for what you do for, for Texas A&M and for the state of Texas. Thank you. The unique spirit and traditions that make Texas A&M University a place like no other are deeply rooted in the core of cadets. Established in 1876, along with the university, the core is the most visible part of Texas A&M's rich history. These are their stories. Ladies and gentlemen, now forming at the north end of Kyle Field, the nationally famous Fightin' Texas Aggie Band. The Fightin' Texas Aggie Band is known as the pulse of the spirit of Aggieland. And front and center leading the band is the bugle rank. The bugle rank consists of 12 seniors within the band. At halftime, the bugle rank begins the band's performance with their signature flourish that generations of Aggies have come to love. Because of the complexity of the halftime drills, these Aggie bandsmen go beyond the call of duty to make sure their precision and technique are to the highest level. The Keepers of the Spirit have many traditions and experiences that have shaped the Texas A&M legacy for over 145 years. This is the Corps of Cadets at Texas A&M University. Breaking Away, how the Texas A&M system changed the game chronicles a decade of system milestones and the people who achieved them. Available from major book retailers and the Texas A&M University Press.